There's no doubt about it, the entire world is affected by COVID-19. We are living in what I call the Corona times. We're not allowed to go to work, go shopping, and we're not allowed to go to dance class. We have to stay home. So what does that mean for our beloved dance industry? How do we keep dancing, which we know we have to do, but from home, which we must do? On the one hand, we have parents wanting to keep some normalcy in their children's lives. They may be stuck at home, but what do we do to give them their outlet, to give them that release from the mundane world of their bedroom, the kitchen and the living room? But we also need to remember that dance education is a business with many people's livelihoods depending on it. Studio owners worldwide want to look after their staff who rely on their income generated from teaching dance classes. But if we can't be in the same room as each other, if we can't be in our beloved studios, how do we continue to generate an income as a dance teacher? I was privileged to talk to somebody who's been teaching dance voluntarily within the virtual space for almost two years now. Audra Allen Dance offers dance coaching supplementary to studio dance classes and has been doing so via Zoom for one and a half years. When I found out about Audra Allen Dance, I knew I had to meet with the woman behind the virtual studio and pick her brain on behalf of the dance community to find out the best way to transition dance classes to the virtual world. This is Audra Allen, who I have been raving about on my Dance Geek page for the last couple of days. Um, Audra, thank you so much for joining us here today. So happy to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Now, I, my subscribers know this, but I'm an Aussie girl. So I'm in a little town called Melton in Australia. Where are you coming to us from today? I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana, USA. I'm just going to ask you as a personal favor, can you say New Orleans again? New Orleans. Mm. All right. So we pronounce it New Orleans and I hate that. One of the few places in America I still want to go to because I've been to New York and that's pretty much all I wanted to do. I want to go to, to New Orleans, but when you say it, it's much nicer. Especially from here, I haven't learned soon. Pretty much the only time it's not considered pronounced correctly when you say New Orleans. That's the only time it's considered not pronounced correctly. Right. I'll, I'll, I'm going to work on my pronunciation because when I eventually get there, I, I don't want to sound, I don't want to sound like an Aussie hick. Um, but yeah, look, I, I'm so excited to not only be talking to you because of who you are professionally, but for the pure and simple fact that you are from, you are coming to me from New Orleans. Does that yeah. sound better? Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> So let's get to the part that people actually want to hear about. There's people sitting around watching this going, Claire, my business is about to go under, get to the good stuff. So I'll stop talking about my personal travel dreams. Um, tell us about you. Who are you? What do you do in the dance world? So I am Audra Allen. <laughs> um, I do a few different things in the dance world. Uh, the reason why I'm here is my experience having a virtual dance business online. I have a virtual dance center I created over a year, a year and a half ago called Audra Allen Dance LLC. And the initial goal was to start teaching students online virtually from my dance space here in my house in my third bedroom converted into my dance space um, to their home and their dance spaces wherever they are online live. The whole, the main focus was to keep it live. So the only difference was not being in, in the same room, but still the training could be there. Yeah. Um, I've been that now for over a year and I absolutely love it. And I also am an adjunct dance professor at a university and I am a single mother part-time. I share, share my, my little humans with their dad. And, um, I have a master's in dance. I, I do teach dance. I'm a virtual business dance coach now and I choreograph and I still perform when I can in New Orleans. I'm still taking class and dance is everything. So. Wonderful. Now, 
there was one little thing you threw in there that you're a virtual dance co business coach now. And that to me in this climate right now made my brain go, yes. And that's why we're talking today. I watched on your website, um, I watched some of the amazing choreography you've done. Um, and in a different time, we would be talking about that. And I'd love to spend our time talking about choreography. But unfortunately, at the moment, dance teachers are not talking about dance. We're talking about technology and how to bloody will do it online, um, <laughs> unfortunately. So after this is all over, we are doing this again. And I am talking to you about your choreography because it's gorgeous. But at the moment, you're actually able to coach people who run dance businesses in how to transition online, aren't you? Yes, and it was not something I sought out. It was very much, I do believe that things happen for a reason. And initially when I started my business, I spent the last year just trying to justify, I guess, sell other educators in the dance world that the virtual setting was a viable place to continue dance training because up until now, that wasn't, that didn't yeah. seem like to do things. And I do want to put my business has never been, has never meant to um, replace training in the studio. All of my students I work with, it's supplemental training, which is my intention to begin with. And the people I work with are, you know, training more seriously in different capacities. It's not necessarily recreational training. Um, so I, I reached out to a good friend of mine, Erin Pride, and she has a comfortable setting in the virtual world, and she runs Dance Boss podcast at Dance Boss University. And I reached out to her to have her collaborate with me in a workbook I wanted to create just as a free resource because I thought, how can I contribute with my experience thinking that's all I would be doing? And she and I created this workbook and sent it out to the universe. And I decided to hop on Dance Teacher Network and do like a live tutorial, thinking nothing of it. Like, I'll just hop on and say, these are the things I know are different teaching online persons in the studio. These are some things I've learned. And from there, people contacted me saying, will you please coach me? I need one of them with you. I need faculty training. I need help. Yeah. And since then, it's been over a month now, I've, that's what I've been doing. And um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity, but it makes sense with my business experience as well as the hands-on teaching as well as what I've done in the past with my different roles in the dance world. And I've seen a lot of studios so far finding success and ongoing growth and helping them figure out long-term how this is going to be sustainable for them. So, yeah. And I, I think what you were saying at the start of that answer about how it's not, um, this wasn't what you sought out, but you had already made the decision to go online yourself. And I'd like to talk a bit more about that. Um, I, I'm a tech hit. One of the reasons my channel and my online persona is Dance Geek is because there's a lot of me that is a geek. Um, most of that is that I uh, is two things is one that I am such a advocate for technology, especially virtual technology. Um, but I'm also a ma massive sci-fi nerd. Like I'm a card carrying Trekkie. So I'm a hardcore geek. I don't need to be sold on going online. Um, and when I heard that you had done this already, you've been doing it voluntarily for over a year. I was like, yeah, great. That's an awesome idea. I've thought about it. But the majority of the dance community and the majority of the world are like, no, why would you voluntarily do this? So in your own words, why on earth a year and a half ago did you say, hey, let's do dance teaching and dance coaching online? Um, it's not something I like, thought I had this brilliant idea um, actually <laughs> close to it as well. Uh, initially stepped from my divorce, to be honest. Um, yep. I essentially was given a blank slate to do whatever I wanted and I knew I wanted to make sure whatever I chose to do was something I loved and was beneficial and was a challenging learning curve for me but still stayed in the dance world. And I was sitting in a Starbucks coffee shop doing my usual like journaling and thinking through like what the options are. My cat just came in. Into the yes, that's my kind of Zoom bombing when an animal jumps through. <laughs> um, and I'm a religious person. I do believe in God. So however you want to identify with this, but I had a very, very strong thought and impression that I just needed to start teaching dance online. And I was like, that's, that's crazy talk. But I've had these impressions before. They've always led to successful things. I always recognize they're from a higher power. And I was like, okay, something's up. But I also knew that I literally had nothing to lose. Like I have blank slate in my life. 
it was just me. Like I literally was given the opportunity and I knew that I didn't want to take it lightly. I don't want to just jump into the first nine to five job because I needed money. I was like, I'm in a situation where I already have nothing to lose. What can I do? And so I said, I don't know how to start a business, but I love teaching dance. And I know these other things, other experiences I've had are beneficial to this. And so that was the beginning. Right. <laughs> That's where it was this idea. So I had, I asked myself a bunch of questions like, how is this even possible? Literally, what does that look like to, to, to do dance online? Is it possible to do it live? I didn't know about the resources and software yet. It's like, what kind of what kind of structure do I have in my, my home? Like, do I have a space to do this? What does this look like? I needed the flexibility. One of the things is I needed the flexibility as a single mom. Yeah. To, to have a, like, if my kid's school calls sick, like, I you know if I'm at a nine to five job as a single parent, I can't, you know, I needed the flexibility. And um, I also like the idea of finding me in and putting my life, all the other things I've done that I just wanted to be in control of my days and my schedule. So, so all those things like, like when I need to ask some questions that say I knew what I wanted it to look like and this seemed to make sense. I think, um, I think that makes this so relatable and so similar to what's happening to the rest of the dance community now, because like, we won't get into it too much, but you, I now know that you came to this world, this virtual dance world through essentially something really traumatic that happened in your life being your divorce. And this pandemic is the same kind of, um, it's a similar kind of thing. It's something that just comes along ruptures our whole world and we're left feeling like what the hell do I do um <laughs> and I think it's so wonderful that teachers watching this understand that you didn't just go you wouldn't have you weren't like me I came to YouTube because I'm a techie and I've always wanted to do something like this so it was a very I was in a positive place and I made a positive choice and you know yours was a similar kind of thing sitting in that Starbucks cafe at, um, which by the way reminds me of the if you've heard any of the stories about how JK Rowling wrote the Harry Potter series that she wasn't in the best place in her life and she was able to create this incredible thing and I really feel that's what's happening here you've already done it you were at this probably not particularly great place in your life where everything had changed and you were able to make it work. And now you're able to share that experience that you have coming out of that with everybody else um, who are in a, a diff very different situation, but in a similar place of upheaval in their lives. Cool. Sure so is. let's get into the specifics of teaching online. Um, you've been using Zoom before all of this, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Why did you choose Zoom? Um, I said I had that question of how to make this work because that's the main selling point for my business was always been live teaching online. I knew there's already programs that were doing pre-recorded, you know, that we know of the bigger names. I don't want to do any name drop. We know the bigger name programs around the world that you can pay into a membership and then you have access to all these pre-recorded classes. And what I wanted to stick to was be able to offer my teaching strength, which is seeing the student and then give feedback and, and help them continue to grow. I didn't want to lose that element. Yep. How I came across Zoom actually was working um, remotely for an entertainment company in Houston, Texas for six months at the beginning of all this. Actually, when I first thought about my business and we used Zoom. So that was my first exposure. And so then seeing that resource, I was like, okay, this makes sense. So I didn't even, honestly, I didn't do a lot of research elsewhere because I knew of other, I just, it already fit what I needed. I didn't feel I needed to do much exploring beyond that. It immediately gave me the first answer of how can I see my students live interactive. So, yeah. And you already, you already knew how to use it, having used it through the other company. Yeah. It's very simple, straightforward on the user side, which is very important. Yeah. And up until recently, there wasn't any huge security issues because it wasn't such a huge popular platform. Yeah. But because it's become so well known so recently for obvious reasons of everyone needing to move to a virtual setting and going with Zoom, that's why it became a higher target and also why people are like, why do you use Zoom with all these issues? But that wasn't an issue a year ago, even six months ago. No, no. Um, I'm not going to touch on the security issues and I know people are worried about that. The reason I'm not going to touch on it is because Audra's already got a video up about the security issues and how you can address them. I believe personally that Zoom is really safe if you know how to use it correctly. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. And I think 
first I want to throw out a fact here, which is um, middle, middle of March when kind of things really started getting heated, especially in the US. Um, Zoom was at 20 million users, and within a matter of weeks, I went up to 200 million users, okay. which is the big factor why the security became a thing. Yeah. Because it's a huge platform. Um, I think the biggest thing is that people are you know, in a place of stress and fear right now with a lot of unknowns. And as a result, with the news and how it's choosing to represent a lot of unknowns, which is some of the Zoom, you know, Zoom bombing and stuff, that the fear is speaking to our decisions and how to use it, how we're communicating with our dance families. So for me, as I'm doing my coaching, just a little tip, uh, being very proactive and making sure you've done your training and your resources and watched your videos and how to safely use Zoom and then communicate that to your families. Because ultimately it comes down to just making sure people understand you're aware of the challenges and then also you have solutions to keep everybody secure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah, so I'm going to link Audra's video about Zoom and security and the updates that were made recently um, through Zoom, which I'm going to say this again, they didn't add any extra functionality. All they did was make default settings um, that were already there, switch them to default and make them like you have to use password, that kind of thing. Um, so the security features were always there. They just sort of made it a bit easier for you to use them or made it default settings for you to use them. So check out Audra's video in the description bar um, on security settings. It just goes through everything you need, including locking the room, which is something that I didn't know about and I learned about today. And I was like, yes, that's brilliant. Didn't know that could happen. All right. So not necessarily specifically Zoom related, but what are your top three tips? If you could give dance teachers three tips and only three tips on teaching in the virtual world, what would they be? The time is different you use on virtually. Stemming from the, uh, the natural lag that happens via sound and or visual just a little bit. So you have to learn to slow down and give time for them to receive your information and then respond and then let it come back to you without being rushed. And that's, I'm naturally, I'm trying to talk really slow right now. And I don't know if you're gathering that or not. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> I'm a very quick person. Like the dialogue in my classrooms, when I'm in person, it was very quick. And an unusual conversation, right? You, you speak, they respond. But because now you have to give time. Mm. Which means slow down as an educator online because if you're like antsy kind of like why aren't you talking if you're kind of waiting it changes the dynamic but if you just pause and let it happen the flow will be very natural I feel like classroom is just at a little bit of a slower pace so you do have to acknowledge the lag that's something that's just what it is in technology so that's my first tip just slow yep. down a little bit such a good tip. I, I've really struggled with that as well. I know that when we eventually get to meet in person in Louisiana, it's going to be us just like, bam, 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 drinks in hand. Woo! But in this meeting, I'm feeling like I'm, pause, let her take it in. I love that point. Pause and let them take in the information, then speak. Tip number two. Okay. So my second tip would be kind of, ties in with the slowdown, but your energy level is going to be so different. Your experience of energy and your energy level itself. So when you walk into the studio in person, we're so used to immediately feeding off of the energy of our dancers. And as dancers, we're just innate with communicating via our bodies, right? We're just, we feel the energy, we're receptive to everyone, whether it's positive or negative. And that's the way that we gauge how our class is doing. And I did not anticipate that and how that would not be available to me going to a virtual setting. And so it took me a little while to be in a room by myself. And the only resource and strength of energy was me. Mm. So my dancers are still anticipating having that coming from me, which is possible to give through a camera. I mean, you see people who are able to be very photogenic and can communicate that energy. So you actually have to first feed your own energy without any other source. And then you have to ramp it up a little bit to send it through the camera so they can then receive it from you very draining it's if you're not used to it at first it's very draining and uh, but it takes some time and you will actually adjust and build that endurance for a higher energy level when you teach online but when i go back into my studio with my college students they'll actually be like did you just teach online you need to take it down a few notches like, <laughs> like, oh, a little much. <laughs> so there's a difference 
give the energy level that you have to rely on yourself versus rely on your students. And I, it's actually helped me grow as an educator and I no longer rely on those. I can walk into any professional setting in person and I know the amount of energy I'm not relying on anyone else's, which is a huge thing I feel like I gave that on the virtual, like on the educator side with virtual teaching. Yeah, that's, oh, that, yeah, again, such a great point. Like, I've, I can't, I hate it when my performers, whether I'm directing a play or choreographing or something, but when people come off stage and are like, just not feeling any energy from the audience, I've always been a big believer that you need to bring the energy and you need to give that energy to them, not the other way around. There is a relationship there, but I feel like as the performer, I try to teach my dancers and actors that you've got to give them the energy. It's not their job to give you the energy. So I think that probably relates to what you're saying with we have to bring our own energy rather than feeding off the students. And I had never, I'd heard that, I have never understood it until having to apply it like this because you can't really apply that concept when you're always around other people and that's what you naturally relate to or go off of. So this is yeah. a very, there it is, applying the lesson now, so. Very good. Okay, and tip number three. To view this, the virtual setting as a gift and as a positive resource versus a negative results that it's going to take time to adjust to and I want you to think back if you have your own studio and you think back to when you started your business or took over the studio you had time to prepare and put your ducks in a row you had months maybe a year to get everything you needed in line to make sure you had your the correct licensing in place your register with how you needed to be the, you know the building is up to code all of those things in place your insurance and you've been asked to take literally a whole new business model and put it into place for some people was days that I helped turn around. And some people have a month where you're going to Australia and you're getting ready for a second term. And I'm working with some Australian clients right now too, but like your time frame has been compacted. And that's part of why the stress is so great. As long as like the, the, the concern of the possibility of your, your studio closing or your, your main source of income. But if you can shift your point of view to this is not, not, not replacing your business model, but adding to it, and you're now gaining another resource how to reach more students long term, I don't believe that you're going to lose your opportunity to have students in house with you. Because right now, yes, it's serving the purpose to let us stay connected with our dancers and their families, which they need and we need so much. But at the end of the day, the dancers want to be in person with you. We all naturally want that human connection and we need that space back. We need to be back in the studio. Yes, this is a great way to serve us at this time, but this is, can be sustained long term. You can add in a virtual adult dance program. You can offer privates this way if you can't, if you don't have room for the studio and someone just wants, wants additional privates and strengthening and not necessarily working on a solo that takes up the whole entire studio. There are ways to not add this to your business model, not necessarily replace the one you already put in place. So give yourself credit for very quickly in a short period of time acknowledging a new business model and adding it to what you've already created and readjusting to make sense for what your needs are. So just changing your shift of view with that, I think will find you, will serve you long term. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's awesome. I, I've seen this happen already where, yeah, like you say, people are having to do this so quickly. And I mean, when you went to the virtual space, I'm sure you didn't set it up in a week. I'm sure yeah. you took a bit of extra time. <laughs> yeah, I, haven't learned, I haven't learned how to have a business. Like I didn't even... <laughs> I had to figure out, I had to do all the basic Googling of what do I have to do to be a business in Louisiana? What does that look like in the virtual setting? I had to research, do I need insurance or not? I had to, you know, work with a lawyer to make sure my proper paperwork was in place because for it's virtual, but still working with minors. I mean, I had to do so much research. Yeah. I, but, you know, that's one of the things is the people already have studios in place. You're not having to go do a whole nother level. You're not having to go do a whole nother business. You're adding a new model. You're adding another level to your business. You haven't put so much work into. So you're not throwing one away. You're adding to it. Yes. Um, and on that note of adding to your business, Audra did a video, I think it was only like three days ago, that was is so crucial. And I really, really want all dance studio owners to go watch it because it's talking about, it's a quick video and it's talking pretty much about creating a new contract with your dance teachers to cover them and to cover you as a business about there's going to be a lot of things that they now have to do that is not part of their 
contract and Audra touches on each topic that you should probably add. It's only a, it's only a short video, meaning it's not a huge new contract you have to do. Um, but you need to cover off things like um, proper storage and safe storage of the recorded videos, those sorts of things. So that's another one I'm going to link in the description below. It only goes, I think it goes for about a minute. So it's not a huge... Yeah. You know what, based on the, the software I use that puts in the, that does the subtitles for me automatically, the video is only one minute. So yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. And, and the thing is, this is such a crucial thing for studio owners to do, but it doesn't take that long. It's not a huge, like I say, it's not, a, you don't have to do a whole new contract. It's basically an amend, an addendum, like an add on to their existing contracts. But these are things that Audra has the space mentally to be able to think of these things because she's already comfortable in this space. She's not learning how to do Zoom at the moment because she's been doing it. So she's able to offer you these extra suggestions like, think about this for your teachers. Um, so it's linked below, go and watch it. It'll help you out a lot. I'm not a spiritual person, but I yeah. do believe, I do believe that now, I don't even believe that things happen for a reason, but what I do believe is that if we prepare for the worst and hope for the best, we can get through pretty much anything. So can you, would you feel comfortable sharing one of your worst experiences in the virtual space so that we can hear it from you, someone who's already done it, and how you got through it, if, if you feel okay, I'm going to speak to doing it as a mom with kids at home. Because I think we like to think about what it's like on the other side, but the reality is my struggles haven't been the student side because they're in charge of their space. My, my struggles have been finding that balance with my kids and I'm okay with going into this. I'm a pretty open book. So two little humans, my daughter's about to turn four and not to go into too much backstory, but she had unexpected heart failure at seven months old without any previous history. And as a result, my family has been through hell and back because that was not something she was born with. And then, so we went into you know, just trying to fight for her life. And then the med I became a medical caregiver. So, but as a result from that, I had a shift in my hormonal balance and I've needed to do therapy and medication. And my daughter had her response to that with her emotional side and she's become very aggressive as a way to protect herself. And so she's in therapy as well, but we're talking years now, we're still addressing this, both of us. And my biggest stress on my personal side is not that my cute little kids are going to come and interrupt the class because they do. My biggest stress on my personal side is that my daughter comes in in one of her modes, which is more often than that, which is out of control rage and having to shift into that responding and working with that in the middle of working in one, with one of my classes, one of my clients. And it's happened a few times. And that's one of why did I think this was going to work? Because I thought I could do this while being a single mom at home with my kids. When they're in the other room, I think they're going to be fine. But in, you know, two minutes into an hour long lesson, my daughter comes in when she was calm right before the lesson started. So what I had to learn is first, I just, the disclaimer with my, you know, they now know the ones I work with are like, okay, I have my kids this week and they know that there's a good chance I might have to mute my side and go away for a minute and let them run the choreography again or go get water and stretch while I go and dress my human. So you actually tell your, your students that? Because that's my, next, that's my next thing. This is not a studio setting. We are not in four walls with the door shut and it's just us and our students and we're interacting with them. We on our side now have our personal homes involved in our professional business. Our students have their homes involved in professional business. You will have your pets, you will have your family, you will have your kids, you will have the, the, US, you know, the delivery service people not going to hurt because they came up the wrong time. The, I, I mean, all the things, and you have to be open to that and acknowledge that your space is different, but what doesn't change, your ultimate value isn't that you are in a studio setting, your ultimate value is who you are as a person and the content you give as an educator. So I had to remind myself, I'm no less valued as a teacher because I had a four-year-old interrupting this lesson that someone paid for. My value is still the same and me recognizing that as a human, that we're humans first. And the ultimately that's what we're here for is to exchange what I offer as a human to their space. And then mm -hmm. there have been times on the other side that one of my one of my adult clients has a kid all of a sudden go throw up and we need to reschedule the lesson in the middle of a thirty an hour long lesson because they need to go. I mean, like there's just the thing. So just I've had to shift my mindset to expecting that perfect 
secure four wall space in the studio to I'm in my home and I have other things that now are going to be influencing this, but I saw my value and also it allowed me to be more sympathetic and empathetic in the process. And also it allows me to see the human side of it and that we're really humans first and we're doing dance second. Oh, I am so glad I asked you that question now because, um, within the dance community and without of outside of the dance community, I am such a big advocate for mothers and getting rid of this mother guilt, whether you're a working mother, a stay at home mother, but just this guilt we put on ourselves that comes from society that we have to be the best possible mother. And we have to be the best possible at work. And, uh, um, yeah, speaking to that, yes, 100% I agree with you. I was very much had that pressure on myself and the mother guilt with my first child, but he was also, I wouldn't say perfect, but he's a very, he's an old soul and very predictable. So I see when things are coming up, like, I mean, there's no, like, no, well, in my face, where did that come from? I could plan for it and made it easier to mother. So I thought I was like, I'm so good at this. The reality is I just had an easy child. Um, <laughs> just give you real <laughs> Oh no, I did too. My first one, easy. <laughs> so, so I, I cannot say that my trauma with my daughter's heart failure is relatable because I can't speak to how it feels to be in a situation of potentially losing your business. But I can imagine the stress and the anxiety that people are feeling. And right now you're still in survival mode when you are literally trying to fight for your, your financial income and something you spent years building. And like that I can relate to because you're in the middle of survival. Yeah. And speaking to that, it's going to be a little while before you're outside and then you're going to realize you've been sitting in this place for a while and it's draining. You're physically, scientifically, your adrenal glands are literally being drained and not going to be recharged for probably a month or even longer as you're in this place of stress. Mm. And on the other side of it, you're going to find that you have to recover first and be even more tired probably. Sorry to bring some sad news to you, but there's a good chance you might be more exhausted on the other side of this for a brief period of time and then you'll come back even stronger. But with that, you're going to realize your expectations and what you have viewed before what was important are going to shift. Yeah. So, so speaking back to the mother side, just because you brought that up, and I love that that's a platform you speak to. I had so many high expectations for myself as a mother. And now one of the expectations are these two things. You can judge me all you want, and I will sleep fine tonight. That is not a problem. And it's this. At the end of the day, my are alive, and when I'm to sleep, they know that I love them. Yeah. That is, yes, that is so... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so many studio owners talk about having like studio babies and studio kids and that their kids are kind of, they, we talk about it in a self-deprecating way um, that oh, our kids are used to being neglected. Like if you're the kid of a studio owner, you know, you don't get a lot of mum time. And I don't think that is a bad thing. And I think we need to stop whether it's in the virtual space or in the real world where we're physically in the studio, we need to stop giving ourselves crap and being self-deprecating about the fact that our kids might not get as much time as what you consider the perfect mum to be because you're dead right. As long as your kids are alive and they are, they know that you love them, you're doing a great job. And on top of that, you are showing your kids how wonderfully strong and boss ass a woman can be by running your own business or being a dance teacher and giving them the love that they need whilst you do these things. And studio owners, you've been doing this for years. If you've got kids, you've already been doing this. It's just now you get to do it from home and sometimes they're going to crawl on you. <laughs> All right. So, um, so what exactly are you able to offer the dance community at the moment? Um, and, specifically on that, I think there's sort of, there's two groups. There's studio owners, they run the business, they have to oversee everything. And then there's the dance teachers who don't run the business, but they still are in the same position as the studio owners where they they might be a bit, I don't know how to do this. So what are you able to offer? So immediately what I'm able to offer, what I've been offering is the ability to safely, securely, and confidently transition to a virtual setting for a business, speaking to the studio owner side, and also quickly if needed, um, to quickly put into place 
learning the technical side as well as how to communicate with your teachers, how to actually do training sessions for the, the whole faculty and staff on what Zoom is or the different platforms that are chosen. And I talk to and I do trainings on how teaching online is different than in person, how to utilize Zoom in your classroom setting. And also then how to speak to your families, like how to meet with them, what, what your options are based on if your studio offers all access classes or like whatever that program is, you're able to figure and fine tune what, what makes sense best for your individual studio, short term and long term virtual setting work. Um, I have been doing um, sessions with individual art, like freelance artists, trying to figure out how to move to the virtual setting. And as a result, I'm actually currently putting together um, a beta group essentially to put together like a three month coaching series for freelance artists who are not working for a studio owner but trying to figure out how to continue to be uh you know offer value but bring income in for the virtual yeah. settings so i'm starting to build that out uh i have a few different things happening in the virtual world um i have my instagram account which is where i'm the most where i'm most active and where i post content daily and interacting with my community there. I do have my, my, my Facebook group has my Facebook profile has been expanding, so I'm trying to show up there more. And I actually just opened a few days ago um, this group called the Dance Educator Resource for a Facebook group. Um, I'm actually about to launch a membership, which is designed outside of all this. It just happened to line up. And this group is initially supposed to be for any paying members to the membership, but I feel in my heart right now that it needs to be open to whoever fits the description of dance educator, studio owner administrator, freelance artist, and it's a community where I offer, I'm, I'm present as well as the community who's in it is supporting each other. So that just became available and I already have a, close to 100 members and we're already all from all over the world and starting to offer value to each other to figure out the different pain points that people are expressing, who are how, trying to go online, who have been online, struggling with different aspects, not sure if they should go online, just support they need, like, it's, so that's become available too, my most recent thing. <laughs> so, they're happening. And also, <laughs> I haven't even said the word specifically, but I'm doing coaching and strategy calls. I don't know if I actually said that, but I do that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. So how do people get in contact with you? If they're sitting here going, yes, yes, please, please do this for me. How do they get in contact with you? You mentioned the Facebook group and your Instagram. I'll put them across, but what are the, what are your contacts? Um, also my website is not available. Um, I'm sure I'm also adding to add in the more information, the streamlining more services being offered because that's slightly shifted but I'm, I'm adding so also i mean just as simple as emailing me too which you can drop in there as well so i'm mainly being i'm being contacted in all those formats so awesome yeah <laughs> <laughs> see and this this happens and we just accept it um yep this happens for me it happens with my children my three-year-old is a little entertainer big time and he will just jump in and be like He's jumped in on so many of my videos pre-corona and he's been like, subscribe and like, and then runs out again. <laughs> and I'm like, yep, he's well trained for that. But is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you want to tell the dance community at the moment? Um, oh, yeah, I mean, first it was anyway. <laughs> Add one more thing to what you talked about. You referenced my video speaking to the studio owners getting something in place for the teachers. <clears throat> I've actually had a few teachers reach out to me with concern, and I'm actually still brainstorming with them how to, how to present this movie forward. But their concern is that their work that's been secluded to the studio in a protected way to where their, their work as a teacher, their content that they've created with their type of teaching is now being shared more broadly than it's been before. So they feel like they're losing control of them and that, that the studio might take advantage of their resources now that they've got recordings and take on stuff that they've taken time to create. Mm -hmm. I, don't have a very, I don't have a resolution for that yet. And I had something I hadn't thought about, but I'm grateful it was brought to my attention. So I've actually brainstormed with some of these educators because actually multiple teachers come forward and speak this concern. And um, to figure out how to have that balance in place. Because I've been thinking yeah. maybe business side. So I know that this, I know that this could, I know that everyone can be served well and fairly, but just so as I bring this up, so just keep that in mind that yes, you do have teachers, but most likely you have teachers who teach at multiple places and have the reason why I hire them is because of how they are as teachers. And just to make sure that they feel secure working with you, that, they'll, that the value that they offer you is something that's still appreciated and communicated and that it's done fairly on both sides. 
Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the key there, isn't it? That it's fairly on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us here today, but also thank you so much for making the decision a year and a half ago to go online. <laughs> um, it was prophetic in a way, and you're able now to help the rest of the community. Um, so thank you so much for making that decision back then and for being here today. <laughs> I'm thankful for having me here today. I'm just you know, I'm grateful I've been on this journey to be here to build a healthier community and get to know more people and how it's helping me grow as a business person and educator and human. And it's, I'm just really grateful for it. Yay. That's awesome. Thanks, Hapes. And I will see you soon. Bye. Bye.